so uh, when we start to send out our letters to different organizations, but particularly Northampton High School, we should be asking, do you have an archive of this report? And we want to see what this report, uh, what's the content of the report and what it can tell us about uh, the plans that the Northampton High School uh, in the district altogether took on to uh, figure out desegregation and to promote racial awareness. So we do know that there is a history of that. Uh, secondly, we want to ask Northampton High Schools to give us a demographic history of uh, racial populations. And I think that's a feasible thing that they can do. And again, whenever an organization says, we don't have that information by race, our immediate response should be to add it to our recommendation list for them to begin to collect this sort of information by race. Rachel? So I have a comment to follow up on what you just said, and I also have one data point to suggest. So the comment that's been going, it's been going through my head is that there are probably a lot of areas in which it wasn't broken down by race. And it may have been just an attempt to, you know, not specify this race, that race, the other race. And so I think in various instances, we might have to, for instance, use the census to compare two different things, um, race and education or race and income, race and housing. Um, and in other instances, we may have to just take a snapshot of, you know, pick a year every decade or something like that. I, and, and then make conclusions from that because none of our numbers are going to be perfect. We'll just do the best we can with that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is I think this is in terms of a data point and maybe it's been discussed, but information about income right now of African-American residents and information about income right now about non-African-American residents. And I'm um, just can we remember that there are people up here waiting to speak? Because you guys are kind of bouncing back and forth. Bill? I'm sorry, you finished with that sentence? I didn't I don't mean to interrupt. Um I, I have two I do have two uh suggestions with regard to collection of data. And one has to do with the criminal justice system, which we have not really spent much time talking about here. And I wonder whether or not we have information. We have courts going back in this county uh, for centuries. And I think that there may be, uh, um, there may be information available on race of defendants in the Hampshire courts. And I think that that might inform us and be useful for us in terms of seeing how racism played out in the court system going back a long way. And oh, yeah. I think, so that's one, that is one area I would suggest we look at. The other is, and it really comes from the city council's resolution that formed this committee having to do with the reduction in the population of people of color in Northampton following the Fugitive Slave Act and the uh, conclusion that was raised, that was reached, I think, by the uh, uh, predecessor committee uh, to study reparations, what happened to that population. And I'd like to put on our list at least the possibilities of finding out really what did happen to those people. Why did they leave? And what do we know about them? And the, on the other hand, who stayed and what happened to them? I think those questions are raised by the initial resolution. Right, and, and if folks left, where did they go? Um, Marcia's had her hand up for. Marcia? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, first of all, uh, I didn't mean to cut you off, Sarah and Marissa, but I just wanted to make sure that we were looking up at the uh, screen. No, thank um, you. I, I will keep a better eye on it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I, I thought one of the things we were doing, and I apologize I have to turn my phone off, um, that we were going to come back to what we found out from these different um, cities. Are we going to do that later in the conversation? I just need to say that before I make a comment. 
Are we doing that later in the conversation? Yes. Okay, so that's gonna come back up. So now we wanna talk about collecting just the data points. So I wanna go back to the conversation um, and I, I noticed in the notes um, that it was cited in, somewhere along the line that we talked about getting the, the bring on council if we decide, like uh, in reviewing San Francisco, I think they had a very interesting model. What they did was say, okay, from this is what we looked at from the past. And then they found the things that were still going on from the past to today that they could then say, this is what we should base the reparations on. These are harms that are still going on based on what happened in the past. And so um, one of the things I found interesting about what Bill said was, if we can show that um, after slaves were allowed to come into the state of Massachusetts, you could bring your slave into Northampton with you on vacation. And you, if your slave wanted to stay, they could, they could stay but oftentimes they were forced to go back um, because they were holding their families hostage, so to speak, quote unquote. If you look at one of the stories that the um, the historic um, Northampton historic um, did a study on. And if we could show that part of the reason why people felt comfortable, why is it that people felt comfortable to bring slaves into Massachusetts, even though Massachusetts was known as a place that didn't allow slavery. So uh, so I think there's something to be said there because what was it specifically about the identity of Northampton that allowed that? And just like with San Francisco, what they would do was look at what is specific to the identity about San Francisco that allowed specific things to go on like you know after the gold rush it should have it was an open time for economics and and wealth to be built but there were very specific ways in which north african americans were kept out of that that um that economic time of wealth building and i think those are the things that are going to differentiate hey this is the reason why reparations are so critical. And that's the kind of thing, like if we can show that, I think that's a very strong argument to harms. And if we can be that granular and specific, then this is no longer just about reparations. This is about, um, you know, looking at it as, as like the way the Japanese people could identify, hey, you took me out of work when you put me in an internment camp. This is how much money I should have made during that time period. This is why you owe me this money. Do you see what I'm saying? And that's the kind of like, that's the kind of thing I think makes a difference in then the general argument of just reparations if that makes any sense. I don't know if people follow, could follow what I was saying. Yeah, I actually have something I was going to add. I don't know if other people, actually, go ahead. Um, uh, thank you. So, um, no, I followed you, Marcia, and it, it made me think, or reminded me of an, another thing that I wondered about when we were writing the resolution, which was, uh, I wonder um, if it is a useful, um, be useful information to gather of how uh, many, uh, white folks in Northampton owned businesses or industry or manufacturing that um, that were not located here, but located out in neighboring communities and sort of what, you know, sort of what that looked like relative to, to where their workers lived, where, where relative to where the, you know, in comparison to where the, the business owners and the, the, the titans of the industry uh, lived. I, I I have a strong suspicion that there is a there was a uh, sort of a, a ownership worker divide that that wasn't within Northampton, but 
may have been sort of reflective of of where workers lived um outside of northampton so i don't yeah so i'd be i'd be curious to know how that might break down elise yeah. uh feely found that the titans of industry as you say many of them built their money off of that triangular slave trade and she actually was following one of those families. I can get that information from her because I'm meeting with her about something else. I will ask her about that because she was tracking that. We also can show that what was different about Northampton was anybody at the time anecdotally that they find of people of color having owned land, somehow they always ended up with it being said that it was uh, sold to them erroneously. Um, they didn't have the correct paperwork. And so there was always this thing of pushing people of color into Florence and that they were not allowed to be in here. And I asked the question, is that a reason why there isn't to this day a lot of people of color, the uh, uh, African-Americans that live in this city? Was that sort of has that legacy gone straight through till now that you don't see a lot of African-Americans in this city? The other interesting thing, and then I'll stop, is we found something very interesting with spiritual leaders um, because we were studying um, Pastor Edwards. A lot of those spiritual leaders owned slaves during that time and they were working their farms and doing their manual labor work because a lot of those folks needed that income to support themselves, which allowed them to build up their wealth. And that's something we should look into as well, that there's a tradition in Northampton for this, another legacy issue. Just some thoughts. I had something to add to that conversation. So just to go backwards for a second, um, I was I'd actually be interested in seeing this taxes from from the 1840s and 50s, specifically uh those enslavers who came to Northampton and owned homes, for example. You know what I mean? Like tax dollars that went into Northampton coffers related to wealth being generated in places like in the deep south. That's something that at least for the wealthy, one of the wealthier families, uh, I've been working towards seeing some of that. And so that's a data point where it's like, you know, thinking about, again, industries that generate wealth um, and how that wealth contributes to public funds would be something uh, that I think would be challenging, but but maybe not insurmountable in terms of seeing more of what you mentioned about an unbreaking line and thinking about wealth accumulation and how that functions. Um, Cause that's certainly been a big piece of, um, you know, that ties back to what you mentioned with the, with on a, on an individual level, slave people working farms for people who are going to be able to, that allows them to do the leisure that allows them to be in roles that are not paid. Right. So, so that's something that um, I was thinking about when you mentioned that. Rachel? Yeah, I, I was thinking about Amherst and the work they've done on this. And, you know, we read, I read their report, but I know they collected a lot more data that, that fed into that report. I'm wondering if it would be possible to find out what data points they decided to include. Yeah, actually, I have it here. And when we do our municipalities, I'll be going through and talking about some of their data points. Um, yeah. Great. Marcia? I'm sorry, that was from before my hand was up. I wanted to circle back to some of the NHS, which is Northampton High School points that I was making uh, earlier, just because it didn't end up on the record and I, I didn't give uh, specific details um, for some of the names, but I wanted to mention that there was an era of uh, investigation of racial issues happening on both sides of the bridge. So issues in at UMass, but also issues here um, in the Northampton high schools. 
um, that in the years of 18, uh, 1986 and 1987, there were workshops and programs and conversations that were being had, one of which happened at a Smith College meeting at the beginning of um, 1987. And then uh, some of these incidences um, with racial violence were sparked because there were people filing discrimination um, uh, charges against area high schools. And so one example happened in April of 1987, there was a racism charge that there was a slur on high school, on a high school locker that led to filing of complaints. Um, and school officials say that, uh, say that policies had already existed um, the NAACP followed up with complaints of racial incidences in April of 1987, and the DA's office uh, finished a probe of racial fights um, that were happening in the area. Um, what we know is that um, there was also a particular, um, sorry, the Pioneer Valley Force for Racial Unity um, was created in order to address some of this these issues. And um, even by May, there were still additional discrimination complaints filed against the school. So what we need to figure out is, can we just get those complaints? Are there, is there a history of those complaints with, the, with uh, that the North Air, uh, Northampton High School has? Um, or that the local NAACP office has in, in Springfield. Um, I think that that is a real area of evidence that we need to tap. It seems like there was a whole um, year and a half worth of conversations around that. And I think that that's really one area that we should tackle. Um, and of course, we're going to get to this a little later, but this is an example of, as folks are hearing us talk about research areas, you can start to think, well, I'd like to like do that kind of work. And I'd like to like partner with, with Jeremy and be the person that looks at education and discrimination and, and education. Um, so I just wanted to put that on the record. Um, with specifically um, with African-American businesses and African-American businesses to date, Right. So what is the through line for African-American businesses? So. One thing that we are, I don't know that we know this or maybe I feel it, so I, I don't, you know, let me just put it that way. Um, and that most people and I was reading the article, I, I made a copy of it and maybe I should uh, ask you all, if you've seen in the article that was done in the um, in the paper, um, it was a couple of months ago about an African-American woman that wrote in about not feeling as though she could take an African-American dance class and see other people like her and et cetera. I don't know if people saw that article, but it reminded me that, you know, people of color like to go places where they know they can get their services, um, where they know they can get their services. And um, one of the things that um, I don't understand, uh, I don't even see Latino businesses really present in this community. Um, even with there's about what, 9% of the population is Latino. And one of the things that we know is that, you know, for instance, if Black people can't get their hair done in their community, if you have to go outside of your community to get your hair done, it's harder to feel like that's your community. And that was something of what the lady was talking about. Like, I can't even find an African American, I mean, an African dance class. And I just think we need to look at what are, there must be barriers toward, uh, businesses that we can't see that's not obvious to us um and because i don't think in the whole time i've been in northampton i've ever walked into a black owned business and that's very unusual for a city so you know where is the barber shops you know where are, where are the hairdressing places you know 
that would serve this these people of color in this community. You know, I think the interesting thing with um, San Francisco were the institutions that would be able to undergird people to be here and feel like they're really part of the fabric and the environment of the community. You've got to have those things in place. Do you know what I mean? Like white people wouldn't live here if you couldn't go on to Main Street and get your hair cut. Or you couldn't, you know, go to McGraw, or what's them, the jeweler, you know, like those things are are critical to people feeling like they want to live someplace. If that makes sense. See, I'm not in the room with folks, so I can't tell what is making sense to people and what is not making sense to people. I think we're all listening very intently. No, it's good. It's good. <laughs> I think creating a list of all black businesses, a history of, of that um, is something that we should do. I do know that Forbes library will be able to assist us to some extent because I've, I've already learned from um, Elizabeth Sharp, who is uh, so astute and, and genius when it comes to this sort of research, some of the early examples of black business owners. Um, and unfortunately they do seem to be few and far between, but we do know there it is still um, a black owned radio station, I believe in the area. And that's so, um, so there are some, some highlights. I wanted to add another, one little follow -up. oh, sure. Just one quick follow-up. It, it seems in some cases, it's like the chicken and the egg thing, where if you were going to have a, a salon where African-Americans would be able to get their hair done. Is there, are there enough African-Americans in this community to su support that business? Maybe yes, maybe no. On the other hand, you're not going to get more African-Americans wanting to move to this community if we don't have the kind of services that would support them. And I think it would be really terrific for us to figure out ways to recruit uh, more African-Americans to, to work here. Um, because in my mind, I think that if we had a black owned hair salon, that hair salon would serve everybody, but it would absolutely cater to African-Americans who want to be represented in the in industry. As it stands right now, you have white owned businesses that cater to everybody, right? And the expectation is that white people who work in these locations will cut any and everyone's hair, right? So I think that looking at it in the opposite direction um, would suggest that Black businesses wouldn't exclude anyone, but it would just cater to a certain group of people. Um, a thing that comes to mind and uh, to and I may, is making me think of Councilor Perry and his his uh, interests um, is is I in the in the vein of um, uh, business, but is also arts and entertainment. And are there? Are there any things about our 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 laws and our ordinances or ways that um, that those play out that means that 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 our music venues, our arts venues, have been culturally, you know, almost exclusively white, or 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 that there were barriers um, to entry for um, a, a club or a venue that might be my you know have pre present more diverse. Um, you know, acts and art and entertainment. So I don't know if uh, Garrick has any thoughts about that, but that um, that seems I again when I think about sort of what we were thinking about when we were writing, that was that was also part of it. Is so that we don't we don't have uh, the the arts and culture communities, you know, that sort of grew up in different cities at different inflection points didn't didn't take hold here, um, and I'd be curious to know. If there was anything particular about the way our ordinances went, or or you know worked, or the way things went that meant that that wasn't, like I said, their barriers to starting those kinds of endeavors. No, I just want to mention that that's such a great uh, data point. I'm sorry to steal your thunder. Would you like to go first? Because I was going to say that that was actually one area that I also uh, identified just by going through the Hampshire Gazette's catalog at Forbes is that there are there's a there's a real history there of, of the uh, plays and the shows. And my suggestion should suggestion is that not in in the vein of attacking anybody, but we can say 
Um, if you look at the history of the shows that were all offered between these time periods, th there's no representation, right? But from what I saw, there wasn't very much representation that seemed as though it uh, the shows were thematically connected to African Americans and 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 um, other racial groups, and that is something that we can ask of um, the academy to supply us with a history of the shows, and to do so in a way that does not attack the industry itself, but to say that we are very much so interested in just knowing what shows were offered and what what shows weren't, and we can also ask how many black employees, um, or how many black actors have been employed. Um, and these are the sorts of sorts of questions that we have to have we have to ask with a lot of grace and mercy because we don't want to offend anyone, but it is what is required of the investigation is that we ask these questions. So <clears throat> I know that the Iron Horse is planning on doing a historical look at um, artists and acts that have come through. So I would suggest that we try to pair up with them. I think they may be also trying to work with Forbes to find some of that information. Um, and Marsha, to your point, uh, I've been saying since I first ran as a counselor that our lack of a black hair salon is uh, disheartening as the father of two females, African-American females here. Uh, so uh, I, I also agree that looking at why we don't have these services is, is high on my priority list of things to do. I just wanna jump in and um make some suggestions regarding the, you know some of the questions you all are raising so part of the flurry if you go back to 2020 flurry of interest in dealing with racial racism in the united states has to do with this these and i mentioned this um to sarah has to do with all of these subcommittees forbes library had a subcommittee around racism discrimination and so as I think about the research challenge of answering these excellent, excellent questions, I immediately think to myself that this is this is work that you know my I, I go to St. John's Church Episcopal Church subcommittee that they should be engaging in every realm you're saying Iron Horn any institution that exists in Northampton, right? That claims that they are eager to find out oh what can we do what can we do, very concrete. Data, 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 information. It is very concrete. It's not sexy. It's not exciting. Well, some people love it. I don't. I mean, I like to have the data and then analyze the data, right? But my point is, is that, you know, when it comes to businesses, for example, when it comes to the Chamber of Commerce, all these entities, you know, there are two people, I've met a couple people, right, who say, you know, back in 2021, hey, we're trying to figure this out. We're trying to make this a place that is uh, that people can come and do business and, and go to our businesses. So, you know, as we're coming up with these data points, I think we should remember that nearly every single one of these that's tied to a institution that exists in, or ever did exist, right? That is the entity that needs to be doing the labor. That those two people. Who are who work for that organization, who were a part of the, you know, that they, they probably fizzled out, right? They need to be put to test to find these answers out. And, you know, some of it um will be, you know, interesting for them to learn. Second thing I want to say is just that, you know, when you talk about structural racism, right, most of it has to do with information and bureaucracy, right? So you talk about businesses, black businesses, why are they not black businesses? Why are they not? more of this, more of that. You know, a lot of times the people who have power intentionally don't want a lot of people applying because that creates more competition, right? It's not racialized in their mind maybe, but it creates more competition and that competition leads to, in our view, equity, but in their view, you know, so, so that the knowledge that, that we need to get at to look at some of these larger structures, um, you know, are are ones that are intentional. It's not casual. It's intentional. Who's the person you go to? Look at the high school. How do you get into AP? Well, I don't know. How do you get into this? And there are people that know the answers, but it's kept because it's they know that it's 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 subjective, right? And so this is the way. This is the pathway. You know, if we want to attempt to understand why fill in the blank is not. You know, if you want to do a business, you want to go do a show here. My brother's a recording artist. He wanted to get a studio. I email. Oh, so, you know, he wants to work. In no one. Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe check out this other person that. Right. If you're not in the circle, 
you can't get access because the people that tell the place to do whatever, it's someone's email, phone number, they're over here, maybe they answer, they're not going to answer your call, they're not sure, they let you do things. And so um, this is going to be the task to figure out, you know, those, you know, what it is. Half the time, people don't even know the process procedures. They're like, oh, I don't even know how it works. I just know I call so-and-so, and then they tell me, right? And so this is going to be the great task if we do want to to get at these structural disparities um, in our present moment and, and in the past moments. I just want to say, uh, speaking of institutions too, that you know, we kind of mentioned Smith being there, and I, I would love to know if they have data on how many Black workers they've had, um, how many were actual residents of of the area as well. Um, so, because they are a huge source of of employment here. Bill Newman has had his hand up for Commissioner Newman. Yeah, Bill, please. Um, I, I I think that one aspect of this conversation this evening uh, that leads me to a related data point has to do with uh, Black populations in Springfield, Holyoke, and Greenfield. And I think that looking at those demographics in some detail might lead us to some understanding of why not Northampton? And the Lava Center, as I'm sure most of you know, had a uh, exhibit about uh, African American families in Greenfield recently, uh, really highlighting the robust and vitally important Black population in Greenfield. And we've talked a lot, I think appropriately, about why that did not happen, has not happened in Northampton. And I think that as a data point, if we could understand why not, that might lead us to some really interesting and significant conclusions about what reparations should look like. I went to that event, um, not to the event itself. I went to Greenfield and saw that uh, exhibit that you're talking about. I was there for a poetry thing and um, and, and I was asking the woman who uh, was giving a, answering questions about the pictures and all that went on and so on. And that is interesting that, uh, you know, uh, there isn't something like that in Northampton. Um, but have there been families that have stayed um, and had prominent positions in Northampton that, you know, to do that, oftentimes those folks are entrepreneurs. And I, you know, we go back to entrepreneurship here looks very thin. I, I like I said, I can't even I remember one um, Latino business I've ever walked into. So one of the things, although it seems like the new, the big hit, you know, from before COVID was doing the salsa things on the, you know, the, the, the Friday or Saturday uh, Latino dance events that were going on. And that seems to really caught on so that now there's, you know, dance classes and all this kind of stuff during the summer. Um, but yeah, so I, I wondered about that too. Why isn't there anything like that, even about Latinos, since this seems to be more, uh, this, this area seems more open to, or it seems like Latinos have been able to establish themselves here. So that's a good point. Rachel, so it's something oh. about people of color, period. Yeah, this is Rachel. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate the things that you're raising, Marcia. The other thing we haven't discussed is health. And uh, that's, that's a tricky one. But as Usman was saying, uh, there are institutions that should be collecting data on their own or could be asked to collect data. So I'm thinking of Cooley Dickinson, for instance. But I know there's also the the HIPAA, is it? the Anyway, that's just my thought. <laughs> yeah, no, I was going to add a, um, uh, or sort of uh, what you said and also uh, you, Usman, is that um, maybe, well, and this is just sort of a, 
simple it would feed into what we're doing but also in terms of to the extent that we might be building kind of a library or resource page is is a call for um people's and entities and institutions work that came about uh you know from 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 2020 and i mean because i i do because i agree i mean like almost everything i'm involved with um uh did something responded in some way you know how long lived it was how in depth it was i mean maybe even it, something as simple as we want to consolidate that we want to we want to aggregate that and some of it maybe is useful to our inquiries and some of it's not but but it, it is also maybe helpful to say and here's a here's a resource here's here's what that moment that inflection point yep. what what was generated in that and so it doesn't so things don't get lost i mean i think important work was done in all kinds of ways that we don't know about that i'd be curious to know about when are we when are we going to do the the cities do you, where are we at in the agenda can we just have a we're still talking about research data um Renika is 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 speaking and then we can we can try to shift because I do understand time is of the essence. Yeah. So I just had a few um, follow-up points to think about. So when we talk about business and access, we need to tie it to Bill's point about the criminal justice system, because who is allowed to have access to business loans? And like, and oftentimes, if you look in the country's history, there's a parallel when there's a boom in Black business, there's also a crackdown on black people's freedom and they end up in jail and there's all these various laws and things or like reasons that come up to like prevent to like move that boom so i mean even now like look at the boom in cannabis who is in it who isn't and who can be and who can't because if you are a felon you can't and you know so i think that like that's going to be one of the things we need to look into and for health like the local um, the health department, of course, but also like, I think we should expand our search past Cooley Dick to Springfield because a lot of people go to Bay State mm -hmm. and they should have information. And a lot of the information that we're going to want to track isn't just on the adults. I think we should focus on like the kids and like the neonatal outcomes of black people in Western Mass because they are terrible. And, um, what does like childhood like look like health wise for kids birth to age five when they hit right. school you know like we need to like i think that like those would be very because if we're talking about like reparations and harm a lot of the harm is coming out in the kids and we need to be able to track it mm -hmm. i'd also like to mention that um there were moments in our history, especially uh, in 1986, where issues of housing did arise as major conversations. Um, issues of homelessness have been off and on points of conversation. And we have, um, you know, we have the Bridge Street Shelter, the Northampton Survival, Survival Center, um, but there are also other local sorts of um, shelters, the Amherst Prospect House, the Hadley-based Western Mass Food Bank, there's Jesse's house, Rosemary's house, Grove Street, no homes in Pulaski Park, which was a tent city for a, a amount of time. And so I'm wondering if we can go to the shelters and ask too, you know, do you have occupation data by race? And and if not, can you begin to do that collection? Um, I'm also curious as to know if the city has ever had any commissions, Jim, I don't know if you know, um, or any commissions based on housing or homelessness in its history, um, any sort of policies that have addressed that. Um, and finally, I want us to figure out how we can figure out where complaints are filed, right, with the city. Have there been complaints by race filed and where would they be? Um, it's hard to track them by the Human Rights Commission, which is like so often defunct um, that it's unclear if they have that kind of log of history. Could I wonder if we could get data from MCAD, What's that? the Massachusetts Commission Against, against Discrimination, um, and that's where employment 
complaints would go and uh, Can you say the name of it once more mcad i think it's i know it's massachusetts commission i think against discrimination but you mean the state one right is that what you're the, talking this, about this yeah the, this, As, this that's one. the name of it um I, it seems like we ought to be able to at least get data about what you know how often complaints have been made i appreciate that you use the word ought which doesn't get used enough <laughs> in common finance. uh we ought to, we, ought to. <laughs> we might could we might should could yeah i'm from texas <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, Jeremy, would you like to say anything? Anything that you have in mind? The teacher um, in me wants you to speak. Uh, no, I think I think a lot of uh, what I had in mind has already been covered uh, already. So I think I have anything to add. If, if I do come up with something later, of course, uh, I get uh, raise my hand and add to the discussion. No, for the moment, for uh, it seems like most have covered things education uh the criminal justice i guess i guess on the um the criminal justice and that are we I, i'm thinking are we going to go into like police and like racial profiling and that kind of area or you know prison like i like i'm just curious as uh to what uh because one of you uh i think it was bill mentioned criminal justice so i'm just curious if there's any um more insight into that well, we thankfully have the results of the Police Review Commission at uh, to to access, and I think that's where we would go if we were interested in issues of profiling to document. I also wonder how far back, and Bill, you might have thoughts about this, but how far, what kind of records the Hampshire County House of Correction has? I'm sorry, and the, and the very long records in the court system there is a, uh, I know there was a fire in the archives some years ago, but there's still a lot of records that are stored from Superior and Hampshire County District Court going back decades. I don't know if it collected, if the court system collected data or if probation collected data by race, but that might be a treasure trove of information. And, and uh, maybe the DA's office? Maybe. Any other comments? Oh, I'm sorry. I've got one more idea around that. Um, I wonder if Committee for Public Counsel Services, Public Defender Office, if I bet they've, I wonder if they've started collecting data or if they did in the past. I don't know. Committee, can you say that once more? The, uh, the Committee for Public Counsel Services, um, which is essentially the Public Defender Agency. I think I foresee Bill and I teaming up on some of these questions. Maybe we'll we'll have Jeremy join us. If there aren't any more um, inquiries that folks want to share, we will transition to uh, the continuation of reports on municipal reparations actions. And I believe let you know that I I will have to leave at this point. I am enjoying this conversation, but it is an election night. <laughs> I know. And, and, Good luck. Um, <laughs> Although we know you're going to win. Also, yeah. And with um, my, I'm I'm also going to to yeah. join um, Councilor Derek, uh, Councilor Perry with that. Um, we're really sorry. We realized that it was <laughs> the, it was this night, and we wanted you know to uh, be here for all of it. It's uh, um, we're we're gonna I'm gonna to the high school right. Do what to the high school right here. Uh, That's where the voting is. among all the other, um, uh, there's, there's several places. So, um, we just have events planned and things like this. And, and, and we also just go and, you know, uh, you know, yeah, fret yeah. for, for a little well, bit. Uh, luckily this is all recorded. So I look forward to reviewing this. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Except for the first part. Um, <laughs> so right. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, can I, before I leave and I'm going to give Jim back his computer just in the sense that he, maybe he can help, uh, uh with raised hands or whatever, if, if it's of help to you guys. Um, anybody, um, anybody, any, for any of your remarks, if you wanted to, uh, kind of just jot down some some notes from from before I hit the record button. Mm -hmm. My apologies, I I'm not 
usually in charge of the record button. So, um, sorry guys, yeah. we will be following up and uh, looking forward to the next Best meeting. Thing. Yeah, <laughs> it's exciting. Good luck with everything. Well, Thanks. I appreciate your optimism, but. Uh... <laughs> Did we lose the co-chair? We can't hear you, honey. There's no, there's no voice. He, he went to the restroom, so uh, oh, okay. he'll be back. I was going to say, is, is there anyone else who would like to report? I think that he might be the only one. Do we have anyone else? I, I got a report for oh. uh, San Francisco. Great. Yeah, let's let's get started. Okay. Hey, James Nash. I didn't see you there. Oh, um, right. Hi. So mm -hmm. two things, if we could get in the, to follow up, I didn't know what was going to happen with the person who did the, um, the beginning who, you know, they were giving their public uh, thoughts, like, what are we going to do with that? That was very good questions. Um, I'm not clear about why we're not calling it reparations either. Um, so, I mean, we've talked about it, but, you know, I think it's something that we need to get clear about. So, um, I don't know how that's going to be, um, followed up if that's going to be in the next meeting. I am always happy to put anything on the agenda that someone suggests. So I'm taking this as a suggestion that you would like for us to continue our debate about redress versus reparations. And I could just remind everybody the reason why it is a debate is because there are people who feel differently about the term, um, namely the counselors, Garrick, um, uh, counselors Perry and Elkins, when they wrote the charge and wrote the resolution, they used the word redress. And so they represent that side of the debate. Whereas there are other members, Usman, for example, and Marsha, who prefer reparations. So we're just holding the, the debate and we will raise it again in next meeting. Thank you. Okay, um, just very important uh, around that. The other thing um, was the through line. Uh, if we were in the South, we would be able to see what happened after, uh, while in the middle of, I guess, reconstruction or right after the Civil War, um, many children were put into what they called uh, internships, uh, which were what they were was actual legalized slavery because they did not get paid and they worked doing the same jobs they were doing when they were on the farm in terms of, but they were able to call it internships. And there's some pretty interesting cases of where the families try to get their children back. And the uh, the um, judge overruled the families and said, you don't know what's in their best interest. And this is a good way for them to learn how to be good farmers. And um, would like to know if any of that kind of thing went on in this area in terms, um, and then also there were laws against black men uh, being vagrants, and then they could pick them up and put them on slave on a chain gangs. So is there any of that kind of stuff going on in this area? Don't know, just a curious, just curious about that. Um, first, let me just say uh, thank you for assigning me San Francisco. And, you know, God is, brings this was fortuitous and I had a feeling God was in the background working his magic um I feel like the San Francisco um is a model actually which is not unusual that uh California and Massachusetts often are models for various kinds of new initiatives thoughts whatever for the country San Francisco, the way they structured the report um, immediately caught my eye. It was very much, it was not just totally an academic report. It was written from a place of an understanding of business, uh, government, and academia. So that, you know, the ability to put all that into one document is hard. And I 
And I really liked the way they did the, the way they ran their process of even writing the report. Um, the, there's an executive summary at the beginning of the report. So if you don't wanna read the whole darn thing, you can just read the executive summary and then go look for the recommendations if you're that kind of person. They put the methodology toward the back because most people don't want to read that. <laughs> you know, most people don't care. They put um, pictures of all of the people who participated. Very interesting thing about their committee, what they called uh, AARC was the an acronym which stood for African American Reparations Committee. It was an all African American committee. I should say it was an all black committee because I don't know if all the people on it were African-American, but that, uh, which I thought was fascinating. And they started with some things in mind, which we might want to take a uh, a uh, page out of, out of their book. They came to some basic overall agreements about what they thought like reparations where people of where African American people do this, and um, and what I said to you about this unique thing about San Francisco, particularly because it was a place where people built a lot of wealth, and it was an international um, place, so it should have been a place where Africans from coming off the uh, you know the farms and so on should have been able to thrive in. So that was something that they specifically addressed, which I really liked. Um, uh, let's see, they were formed by legislation and by the supervisors um, for the city of San Francisco. And if I understand the model correctly, the supervisors manage the, the mayor and the supervisors, the, the committee reports to the supervisors. That's who they're responsible to. And they come out of their uh, Human Rights Commission. And so um, they were formed in uh, 12, uh, December 2020, which would have been right before COVID or in the beginning stages, the first year of COVID. And, but like us, they had a lag and they didn't even get started until June of 2021. So there was a six month lag there. With what Marissa said, the first thing they did was call for all relevant documents from the city and county. That's where they started their research, as opposed to sort of, you know, brainstorming. They said, well, let's start with what we already know. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, uh, the other thing that I liked about their reports, and I was, and what I might do is ask for the uh, whoever is our our executive executive summary, our executive assistant to do uh, to uh, send you all the executive summary. the The report is a nice balance of pictures of people, quotes, clarity about stakeholders. Every time there's a section that closes, it's, this is taken from these stakeholders, like real clarity, like along the way. And um, and it gives you that, that, that flavor of what's spe special about San Francisco. And that's, I think, really interesting. And they make the case, which I think is a very strong case, that ultimately, most of this stuff should be settled at the local level. And that the federal the federal is great to be going after the federal, but people live at the local level, which I thought was fascinating. Um, be, and, and of course, they decided to not uh, recreate the wheel. They started with uh, uh, Coates work uh, for the uh, what they will call the continuation of the deprivation of African Americans' ability to plug in to the various systems that were happening in this country um, that were allowing for wealth development, entrepreneurship, opportunity, housing, real estate, all of that. They so that I thought was really interesting. 
And so now let's get to the meat and potatoes of it. Um, their focus, and I like this too about them, when you get into the recommendations, they start off with three basic areas that they recommended. And that was for the city and county of San Francisco to make, of course, the apology for the past harms and commit to making substantial ongoing systematic and programmatic investments into black into the black community to address those historical harms. So they set off from the beginning, we are going to we are going to commit to we believe that the city has to commit to uh, a systematic under uh, program of investments. And then they went on to say they established an independent office of Repar reparations within the city to execute the plan. They believed that that needed to be developed and put in place. Otherwise, the plan would just be a plan that sat on somebody's desk. And then they also said that the city and the county of San Francisco must create and fund a committee of of community stakeholders, such as a, repar a reparation stakeholder authority, similar to, in to ensure equity and continuity in the implementation of these policy initiatives. And the reason why they did that, which is what I really liked about how they did their plan, how they did their recommendations. You know, I'm a planner by, by, <laughs> by work. So they did, those three things were their overarching goals, and then they built plans. Uh, then they built out objectives with specific actions that they believe needed to be done. And then, as I said to you, based on all, every time they created the, like for instance, the place where they put the most in, the most work into was financial reparations. Um, they believed, believed that a one-time lump sum payment needed to be paid out to people, um, that African-Americans' income of lower income households to reflect area medium income, and that that was something that they needed to invest, bringing up those households to the medium income. Um, they believed that they needed to provide a spectrum of financial education and services to people, everything from uh, retirement planning to, from the beginning, how do you manage money and real estate. Um, they even talked about how to ensure unbankable people so that those folks would have an ability to get loans, all the things that we were just talking about, like really uh, in-depth 1.1 action, 1.2 action, 1.3 action, like very detailed ways that this was to be done. That's the reason why they wanted that, that independent group of stakeholders developed that would be called a reparation stakeholder authority. Because to make, to make sure that these things were being done and that those people were holding to account the supervisors the and the uh, mayor and the county. Yeah, go ahead. You can't hear, you know, no. I missed the, the, the second point. You said the first one was the city and county uh, needed to apologize. And then there was a second point before they wanted they... an independent office of reparations within the city to execute the plan. So they wanted a group of, of people that this was their job every day to get up and go make sure that these actions, these objectives were put in place. So, you know, as a planner, I love this. This is like textbook. And then, then they come out. And what I loved about the objectives, so for instance, they give create a comprehensive suite of financial reparations that is made immediately available the, to those who qualify under the eligibility parameters set forth by this committee. So they even developed the parameters, you know, the things that we're talking about that that person said, should we even be doing that? Um, and then they said what the actions should be for that. So that group of people that do this work every day 
and then to have an outside body of stakeholders that oversee that these things are actually getting done. So that body has to report to them and they have to take it up with the supervisors if it's not happening. And I thought, wow, this is like, you know, they made sure they dotted all their I's and crossed their T's. Real now, quick, the thing just to jump in real quick, sorry. Should mm -hmm. we, how many more minutes do you think just to make sure we get the other people in? That, that was the end of it. Oh, okay. that was that, Look at that was, timing. <laughs> I, yeah, I yeah, that was enough said, right? Is there more to say? Absolutely. Excellent job. Thanks, Marshall. Uh Bill or Usman, which one? Go ahead, Bill. Usman, did you either do either Providence or Wilmington? Because I took I did, not, I did not. I did Amherst. Okay, I took a look at both of those. Amherst is more interesting, so let me. I'll do these two relatively quickly, if I might. Real um, quick, I think I think there's a hand raise. Uh, Lisa, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to go after Bill because uh, I also did my homework for um, St. Paul's. Okay, great. So should we get just timing wise? Bill, you got? Can you get six minutes? I can do it. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Wilmington, Delaware, population of 70,000. It is a mayor city form of government. In December 2022, the city council formed a reparations task force, nine persons to be appointed by the city council, tasked with researching Delaware's what they called complicated slave history, and it is. It was group was tasked with making recommendations regarding institutional discrimination against African Americans by mid-2023. They were going to meet at least quarterly, take 180 days to make findings and recommendations. And what happened, a uh, uh, story we should take to heart, uh, the entire effort was delayed because it turned out that the committee did not comply with the state's FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, equivalent of our public uh, records or open meeting law statutes, uh, and they had to go back and start the meetings and do them all over again. So the uh, report now is delayed until 2023, uh, until 2024, uh, and they do hope to have a report out by early next year. Uh, what I thought of as I was reading this is that it will be really interesting to find out what Wilmington came up with. It's only, you know, the city's just twice the size, a little more than twice the size of Northampton. Um, same comparable number of people on the committee, um, a similar sort of charge to the committee. And my thought was that for all of us who have looked into a city or a municipality to have it make a contact with their reparations committee and find out what more we should learn or know from someone who was intimately involved in the process, uh, Wilmington will be interesting because they're on a similar kind of timeline. They're ahead of us, but not that far ahead of us. Um, Thank you so much. Um, let me, I'll do Providence, Rhode Island quickly. Um, Providence is really interesting, but it's also very different. Uh, uh, Providence has a population of 100 and, uh, uh, 189, 190,000 people. Um, and what happened in, Prov in Providence is that the city received its ARPA money, $10 million of ARPA money, and the city said, let's use it for reparations. Clarity, what's ARPA money? It was ARPA money, all unspent, all un... un uh, undesignated for its purpose. Um, and what the city did, they call this, they call this its reparations program. It consisted of utilizing the ARPA money for uh, black, indigenous, and other people of color whose families have felt the effects of discrimination. And interestingly, white residents could qualify based on income. The mayor approved the plan uh, following a 194-page report covering four centuries of discrimination and an analysis of it. Uh, the city did not engage in any direct cash payments. Um, it looked at institutions that could be used to close the racial wealth gap. It targeted uh, investing in minority-owned businesses 
and African heritage organizations and assisting in home ownership. Uh, eligibility, again, uh, something I had not expected to find uh, for Blacks, Indigenous people, and people facing poverty, excluding persons who might have a college degree uh, report in August of 2022. How those programs have worked out, I still need to find out, I still need to discover, but it's a different kind of reparations program. And the resources were available fortuitously at the time the report came out and then the ARPA money came to uh, cities and towns across the United States. $10 million for a city with a population of 190,000. That's a big chunk of money. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's something that we don't have. And our ARPA money is spent as it was the case for almost all the other municipalities that we've looked at. But again, I think going back and having a contact with someone on the uh, reparations committee in Providence and saying, how did it all work? How's it working now? Because it's really in its initial stages of implementation would be useful for us to know. Thank you, Bill. Alicia? Yes, thank you. So um, I had already reported on um, Detroit and then I did was able to look into St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, in 2021, the city council established uh, the St. Paul City Council Legislation and Leg Legislative Advisory Committee on Reparations, appointing 30, 13 members. Um, and in that, they also established the St. Paul Recovery Act Community Reparations Committee on January 4th of 2023, and the ordinance took effect on February 13th of 2023. Um, where they, city council members and the mayor um, worked on repairing the damages caused by public and private systemic racism in the city, um, looking at things like home ownership, health care, education, employment, pay and fairness within the criminal justice system among um, uh, the African-American descendants of chattel slavery. Um, there was a reference list that they provided with a list of um, references around reparations that I can provide um, folks that they can also sort of look at, as well as the recommendations uh, that were made and presented on Wednesday of January 15, 2022. It's quite lengthy. But in short, um, some of the things that I was able to sort of pull out um, fairly um, things that were resolved already is that they did determine uh, public interest to provide a non- uh, a stipend to support the community members and advisors who bring valuable perspectives. Um, this stipend was $50 per meeting for the advisory committee. Uh, they also were able to provide professional and clerical support, staff support for uh, the work of the Reparations Legislation Advisory Committee. Um, in addition, they provided uh, the committee with some tools for developing policy proposals and enabling le legislative proposals. Um, <clears throat> whose mission would be to and uh, recommend actions to address the creation of generational wealth for the American descendants of slavery and boost economic mobility and opportunities for the Black community. And finally, uh, there was a written report from the Reparations Legislation Committee that was provided in 20... Um, to, that was provided... Oops, I didn't finish my notes there. So I'm not sure when it was provided, but I do have links and information that I will share with the committee. Um, and to save time, I will just send that um, to Dr. Patterson, if that's okay, or whomever else would be more appropriate. That's excellent. Love to have it. My last one. Wow, that's a very efficient. Um, so I had the pleasure of looking over almost at the time, hot off the press, Amherst's uh, reparations report, um, seven members, one a couple things to note. So maybe I'll just jump to things to note. Uh, one is that they had a writer who was not a part of the commission. I thought that was pretty interesting um, in terms of thinking about the labor of putting something like this together. Um, same with the designer and other liaisons. They also acknowledge many organizations in the community of Amherst. Um, and I you know, want to take note of that because as I mentioned previously, we have more support in the community we might think we start you know lining up these different uh you know racial or diversity task force and we get them at minimum to get their church synagogue mosque wherever to endorse you know sort of our efforts and participate we're going to have a nice chunky list like they have 
of community partners who we can acknowledge for their you know help and participation. Um, just to skip to the the, the data points um, in the report that I think is interesting. The the first I would say has to do with this question of structural racism. So a major part of their findings. Um, it do involve what they call structural racism, and that includes going back to 17th, 18th centuries, thinking about labor and slave labor, labor more broadly, um, and just really defining that. You know, that's so. That's, in other words, that's a part of their actual data points and findings. Um, that goes on to talk about uh, discrimination in the 20th century uh, from barber shops and and just the general challenges. Um, the black people in Amherst face. So this is a part of their research. Um, and so in terms of their second part of their findings, needs deals with this question of black white disparities. A part of that includes um, thinking about income of black residents as a data point, home ownership as a data point, the ideas of quote unquote rent burden as a data point, Right, researching the idea of rent burden. Um, what is that? Quote unquote rent burden, the disproportionate number of black households that are forced to spend one third or more of their income on housing alone. Right, so renters who don't get the benefit of that. Uh, another data point uh, has to do with employment, and they note that UMass Amherst is one of the largest employers. Um, and so that's a, a, a place to research in terms of employment discrimination and also the ideas about those who labor there, what that means. They did mention COVID, uh, COVID pandemic as a data point to look at the way in which black employees, um, you know, were, were furloughed in relation to others. Uh, and another data point is uh, acts of racial hostility, charting that as a data point. Um, the next data point has to do with medical bias, they call it, right, in terms of uh, local providers. Another data point has to do with health, food insecurity, and they have data on that. Um, I already mentioned housing. They Then they talked about transportation, so PBPA transportation and looking at that, um, you know, as a, a possible impediment to access to jobs in Amherst and other places and, you know, getting around uh, the, the city. And then the final data point uh, has to do with uh, the experience of driving while black, as we know, we heard of that. And so uh, police stops um, is another data point. So it is an ambitious list of data points. I mean, similar to our, our list of data points, there's a lot in, in here, but I do think that ultimately they do break down around history. So researching history of race and racism and you know the impact that's had uh, as a sort of initial effort, and then going into what, you know, as Marsha mentioned, might be things we can look directly and, you know, draw a line to in the 20th century, perhaps, and even the 21st century, um, as potential data points to be able to uh, identify and be able to put some statistics and numbers behind those data points, specifically dealing with Black, white racial disparities. Um, so I just, you know, I skipped to that. Uh, oh, yeah, I should probably say that this is, and I'm looking at my own watch, which I conveniently forgot to press the six-minute mark, so I may go over and look at the clock. Uh, but I'll just say that th this is how they think it should be funded. One, operationalize $2 million in reparations endowment fund within four years okay, through, can uh, through combination of cannabis tax revenue, funds borrowed from the reserves, et cetera, right? Uh, augment the two million endowed funds with monies from commu the Community Preservation Act and Community Development Block Grants. Collaborate with private citizens to establish charity. Right, and they mentioned Friends of Forbes Library, so it would be a charity that would be people who just want to donate to, uh, rep you know, provide reparations. Pursue additional grant funding through private foundations around each one of these. You know, I'm filling this in; they don't have it here, but what they mean is. Each one of those data points, when there's a race, you know, racial disparity, going to different private entities, saying, "Listen, this is what has been happening, and you know, what do you imagine you could do to help with that particular sub area?" 
um, pr pursue special litigate uh, legislation. Sorry, pursue special legislation to permit direct cash payments to residents who have experienced specific racialized harms, and collaborate with other municipalities to advocate for statewide legislation that that would permit such direct payments. Just to add, you know, I, I actually my brother was a beneficiary of such a thing when he worked in construction in New York City. Uh, where because of federal legislation, the construction company was sued and he got back pay. You know, you don't know that you're getting two dollars less than everybody else. Um, and so this is examples of ways in which, you know, we could find evidence of this for all the construction projects they do in, in, uh, in Amherst, but thinking about Northampton, um, similar things. And then adopt the charge for the successor town committee to carry on the work. So this goes back to what was mentioned previously. Who's going to do the work after the commission's over? They have a, in here um, some direction towards that. And this is the final one, is establish a town assembly for African heritage residents to operate as a forum to discuss and propose specific reparative in, uh, justice initiatives uh, to the AHRA successor committee on an ongoing basis, right? So not just ending with having a committee, but having some normalized, you know, sort of, you know, periodic opportunity for people to discuss how it's going, and also uh, potentially raise new points to be taken up. So uh, that's Amherst. Thank you so much for everyone who to everyone. Um, Bill, do you have an outstanding comment or question? I, I really have a question for Usman, which is that the community survey survey I thought was a really important part of that that might inform some of our work. And I was wondering if you could comment on that for a minute. Um, beyond. I mean, so they, they did. I have I have my opinion about it. You want, to, want my opinion about it, or you want me to just to describe it a bit to people? What no, they I'd say be, about? It? I'd be happy to have your opinion. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I'll just say real quickly that the idea was to you know include participation as they did this gathering by putting together a survey for the community. Um, my opinion about that that survey, you know, generally speaking, is that. You know, participant, it really is dependent on participation and what we found, particularly with black people in such tiny, hyper, you know, white spaces that participation can be very, very low. And so uh, some of the energy, even a university campus like mine, the energy spent putting stuff together like that can yield, in this case, some degree of, you know, is more active group, maybe an Amherst learning larger. Um, so that's my opinion about it. So, but it's a tool. I have since put it on our agenda for next meeting to uh, discuss their questions specifically. Marsha, do you have an outstanding comment? Yeah, um, uh, two, three things for future. One, can um, we all, we're, right now we're doing this all from our heads. I think we need to have an experiential thing. Can we go to the Museum of African American History in uh, Washington, D.C.? And um, uh, for legal counsel, something that came up that I thought was interesting in um, San Francisco was what is the situation with affirmative action, whether or not you can legally do this um, was a question they left out, that a question they put in the report for them to look at because you, we can say all these things, but affirmative the affirmative action being struck down may or may not allow us to do these things. And that was a question they had. Um, and then, and then uh, the third thing was uh, San Francisco took two years to do this. They didn't try to do this in 12 months. You know, they first called for all the documents and they took themselves through a process. And that's something we haven't really talked about doing. Uh, we don't have an overall process for this. And that is something I think we need to put in place um, or at least develop one so that we know exactly how this is going to roll so that we do get to that end point with a final product. So that's uh, three things to Oh, and a fourth thing, sorry. Uh, Alton said last year that he came to you guys about doing um, African-American, uh, I'm sorry, Black History Month. 
it's back. I'd like to put that on the agenda for next time because the church is doing another Black History Month thing. And he said last year he got to you guys too late. So I'm giving you a three months notice. All right. Thank you. What a wonderful meeting. So, so very uh, productive. All right. I make a motion to uh, adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Thanks. Second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed. All opposed. Huh? We have to go through each name. Oh, yeah. Remember? Thank uh, you. We go through each name. Yep. You can't just say. Just oh, yeah, hold on. I'll, I'll do it. And uh, let me pull up the. Okay. Uh, roll call. Uh, for to uh, adjourn, uh, Bill Newman. Yes. Alicia Lundquist. Yes. Derek Perry, not present. Jeremy Baker Paquette. Yes. Marissa Elkins, not present. Marsha Morris. Yes. Osman Power Green. Yes. Renika Montgomery Camaclo. Renika. Renika. Yep. Pardon me. Uh, Sarah Lynn Patterson. Yes. Uh, Rachel Naismith. Yes. Uh, and the last seat is vacant. Uh, uh, Chair, you are adjourned.